Good afternoon and welcome to the inaugural Harvard Alumni Day celebration and the 152nd meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association. My name is Nancy Sinsabaugh and it's my honor to be a member of the class, Harvard Radcliffe class of 1976 and the Harvard Business School MBA class of 1978. We are here in Harvard's Ter Centenary Theater today celebrating the second part of the oldest recurring outdoor ceremony in the Americas. My partner today is once again William Bill Horton, hockey player from the great Harvard College class of 1977. And Bill, you're celebrating your 45th reunion this year along with your classmates. That, it's an honor to be with you today. Thank you, an honor to be with you too as well, Nancy. But I think in all fairness, we should point out that I was a hockey player in another century from oh, where we are okay, right now. All right. So, but thank you and welcome to Harvard Alumni Day. And Welcome also to all of you online, those clubs and shared interest groups who have got together to watch today uh, from around the world. Harvard Alumni Day is the Harvard, uh, uh, the Harvard Alumni Association's university-wide and global event honoring and celebrating alumni impact, citizenship, and community. As part of Harvard Alumni Day, our keynote speaker, Tracy K. Smith's fellow alumni, will be able to reconnect in person with each other and to a campus many have not had the opportunity to visit due to the pandemic for two consecutive years. In addition to Smith's address, highlights of Harvard Alumni Day will include the traditional alumni parade through campus, remarks by Harvard President Larry Bacow, and a ceremony honoring this year's Harvard medalists. The Harvard Choir and Harvard Band, with many alumni participating, will provide musical interludes. This day will be the highlight of the alumni calendar. With traditions and the pomp and circumstance we all love, we are excited to welcome our alumni back to campus after such a long hiatus and to celebrate our global alumni community. Now, last week on May 26, the 8,870 graduates of the class of 2022 were welcomed by President Bacow to join the company of learned individuals. As well, the classes of 2020 and 2021 celebrated their in-person commencement last Sunday, May 29th, with in-person celebrations that had been postponed due to COVID-19 epidemic. For the university's second commencement in four days, nearly 9,000 of the graduates attended to make their return to Cambridge for the full cap and gown experience and to hear featured speaker, U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland, class of 74 and law school class of 77, who made a plea for more to embrace public service for at least some part of their lives. And at a time when the nation's democratic institutions face historic threat, it's especially important. The president, provost, deans, faculty, students, staff, alumni, and keynote speakers <laughs> came together for a very special online graduation events for, for the classes over the last Thursday in May over the last two years, celebrating achievements of our graduates and confirming their academic degrees online. And I just want to say, Bill, as a note about um, last week's uh, celebration for the classes of 20 and 21. There are 13,000 graduates in those two classes and more than 9,000 made the trip back to Cambridge and many of them brought their parents and families with them. So it was quite a joyous celebration for those who were not able to celebrate in the actual year that they graduated. It was touching to see that, to see that the connection to Harvard uh, remained for all of those, all of those alumni. So we celebrate again together this afternoon, this time alumni. As students, as recent graduates participate for the first time as alumni with their fellow alumni, those present here and those around the globe. So if we think around the globe, we welcome those in Melbourne, Australia, where it is Saturday, 5.30 at 5.30 a.m., GMT plus 10. And those in Asia, in Southeast Asia, in Europe, in South America, and of co course, those across the United States, Mexico, and Canada, as well as those in Hawaii. So we really <laughs> do cover the globe with this global alumni celebration. 
our newly minted graduates now take on the, the responsibility to further the interests of the university. And is inscribed on Dexter Gate, which is near the Wigglesworth Dormitory on the edge of Massachusetts Avenue. Graduates are encouraged to enter to grow in wisdom and then depart to better serve thy country and thy kind. This afternoon is that first step for these new alumni in a long journey of self-discovery and service as alumni, citizens of the university, and citizens of the world. And we would like to extend a particular welcome to the 8,870 who graduated last Thursday and their parents and families who may be watching as well. More importantly, because today's Alumni Day, we'd like to welcome the 14 college reunion classes who are with us today, beginning with the great class of 1952, who graduated 70 years ago, as well as all of those in their Crimson Society who are alumni, having celebrated every year since their 50th. And, and, not, and not to forget, the great class of 77 well, celebrating its 45th right reunion. exactly Thank as you. well as the <laughs> the um great class of 1972 celebrating ah, their 50th yes. reunion as well as the class let me get this right 1997 right. celebrating their Correct. 25th reunion so there are more than <laughs> 10,000 alumni of harvard and radcliffe colleges who come to cambridge today to celebrate <laughs> their reunions and also participating in reunions, un, reunions this week are graduates of Harvard's 11 graduate schools, including law school, and that also incorporate today's Alumni Day into their program. Our 25th reunion class, the great class of 1997, has chosen Allison Hobbs, AB 1997, as our chief marshal to lead the alumni festivities today. Bill, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Allison Hobbs. Sure, and also about the election of the Chief Marshal ah, in a yes. time-honored tradition. Since 1899, the 25th College Reunion class has been charged with selecting their Chief Marshal based on criteria that include success in one's field as well as service to both the university and broader society. As this year's Chief Marshal, Allison Hobbs, joins a list of illustrious alumni who have held that position, including former U.S. Poet Laureate Tracy K. Smith in 1994, who's our, our speaker today, and uh, astronaut Stephanie Wilson, class of 88, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Linda Greenhouse from the class of 68, and City Year co-founder Alan Kazai, class of 83, and that goes on to include Secretary of Edu former Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan, who's a class of 86, and former Rhode Island Governor, now Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, who's class of 1993. So today we'll have Vanessa Liu, who is the Harvard Alumni Association president, who said about Allison Hobbs as a respected historian and storyteller, teacher and scholar and community builder, Allison Hobbs has spent her career helping us understand racial injustice, its complex human cost, and how history is something that links and impacts all of us. Fitting words for, for today, Nancy. We talk about history, maybe you could tell us about Harvard College, a little of the history of Harvard College. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> if we could have the shot of John Harvard. Yeah, we... And as you see John Harvard, the statue of John Harvard, which sits in Harvard Yard uh, by Daniel Chester French, and you see the alumni parade beginning to uh, form in front of John Harvard. Um, and this space that you see right there is where Harvard College was actually founded. It was founded in 1636, chartered by the uh, elders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony to both educate ministers as well as to educate the Native Americans that they had found there. Originally in 1636, it was called New College and the town of Cambridge was called New Town. Now, unfortunately, there were no funds to hire tutors and scholars. And so uh, these names were changed in 1638 to honor John Harvard, a graduate of Emmanuel College at Cambridge University, and a Puritan minister in Charlestown who died in 1638 without any heirs. He left all of his books and half of his fortune to the fledgling college. So the funds that he bequeathed allowed the college to finally hire tutors 
to begin teaching young scholars in the year 1638, which is why on the front of the John Harvard statues, it says 1638, not 1636. So 1636 was the founding, but the actual teaching began in 1638. And if you're wondering for a college that started in 1638, why last week was the 371st commencement rather than the 386, the answer is that in the early years, commencement was only held when there were graduates ready to commence their life after college using the learning they had acquired as students. The first commencement at Harvard was held four years later. And now we see, Bill, the alumni parade beginning to start. And right. we can hear the Harvard band, which th now is the Harvard alumni band. So alumni who were members of the Harvard band are with us today to play, uh, once again, their favorite songs. And you can hear them in the background. And there, if we could have the view of the Harvard band processing in front of University Hall. There they are, the Harvard alumni alumni band. What a great tradition we're starting today. Not only Alumni Day, but the band of alumni performing yes. for us. So you are with us today on the very first Harvard Alumni Day, which has shifted. We used to do this the afternoon of commencement, but now there are so many people who come, back, come to commencement. There are so many uh, alumni who come back to reunions. There simply isn't space enough for them all on commencement day. So today is our first day of the uh, Harvard Alumni Day. So Harvard commencement, the first commencement was 1642. And then they were held intermittently over the next decade, depending on uh, whether there were uh, scholars who had finished their uh, requirements. Commencement continued till 1773. During the revolution, there was a hiatus for eight years. Oh, and we hear, oh, the, and hear the tones of the bagpipe piping in. And here are the oldest the, alumni oh, who they're, come they're today there. to join us in the alumni parade. And we begin to see them marching. What a wonderful tradition. This it is, is a this wonderful is. tradition. And, and in 2000... Someone touching John, Dar John Harvard's toe. For there a you go. <laughs> yes, we, the tradition is you see John Harvard's toe is a little is a little more <laughs> golden than the rest of the statue. It's because it's good luck to touch John Harvard's toe. Look at all the people <laughs> touching his toe to, for good luck. So Harvard in 2000, 2020 was unable to um, hold an uh, actual in-person commencement, so we held the first virtual commencement. Likewise, in 2021, we had another virtual commencement. But here we are, and Bill, maybe you could tell us about the history of reunions that have led us to today's Alumni Day. Sure, and we see on the screen right now, we see the class of 1997, the 25th reunion being piped into there the we yard, are. Into the Tercentenary Theater in front of Seaver Hall for all of those who remember and being applauded roundly by the marshals. And being cheered on their path. Exactly. Now, this is now part of Harvard reunions when the, the started in 1643 when the graduates of the class of 1642 returned to Cambridge to celebrate. In the early years of the college, officials of the Massachusetts Bay Colony were worried that the college might not survive. And so each year, at the time of the graduates' orations, at the time of commencement, politicians, ministers, merchants, farmers, and other elders of the colony would travel to Cambridge to celebrate with the graduates, listen to their speeches, debates, orations, and join with their feasts and athletic contests. It was a way for the leaders of the colony to show their support for the young college and its graduates. Alumni were invited to attend as well. And as the 17th century progressed, Harvard alumni soon outnumbered the other guests at this annual celebration of the joy of learning. So now we're seeing even more alumni from the early, uh, early class of the classes they were saying 1958, uh, going in, uh, just for processing in front of Jard Harvard. And so this is how a uniquely American tradition of commencement festivities and alumni reunions began, a tradition now shared by major universities around the world. Since the mid 17th century, alumni have returned to Harvard to celebrate along with graduates and their families. Bill, as you know, in modern days, we've had Harvard Alumni Association meetings since 1848, when John Quincy Adams was the first Harvard Alumni Association 
president. We say of John Quincy Adams that his term as president of the United States was preparation for the presidency of the Harvard Alumni Association. And then we now see the 25th reunion class moving up to the stage, the honored class gets to sit on the stage for the afternoon's festivities. Bill, what can we expect to see this afternoon at the uh, 152nd meeting of the Alumni Association? Well, the speaking program, Nancy, will be led by the Harvard Alumni Association for this year, Vanessa, Vanessa Liu, who is a graduate of the college in 1996 and the law school in uh, 2001. And we're also very excited to welcome former poet laureate of the U.S., Pulitzer winner and Harvard professor now, Tracy K. Smith, who's the class of 1994, as the Harvard Alumni Day keynote speaker. And I'll note the first keynote speaker, as this is the first Harvard Alumni Day. So we're very excited to have someone who has added profoundly to the thoughts of Americans over the last decades in Tracy K. Smith. The program will also feature a report from Harvard President uh, Larry Bacow, who's also an alumnus uh, from the Kennedy School and the Law School of 1976 and also Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, where he received his Ph.D. in 1978, who will celebrate the 2002 Harvard Medalist and the recognition as well of Chief Marshal of Alumni Allison Hobbs and more. So we, we have a very packed event that will start and, and uh, when Vanessa Liu uh, rings in the, the meeting with her gavel and will point out that on the stage, you'll see a number of, of different people, including President Baco, uh, and we'll, we'll also see uh, the incoming president, Alison Mendenhall, his class of 1991. But we can point some of them out as they take their seats on the stage. So, Nancy, let's let's take a look at, at what's going on on the stage, and then maybe in the in the old yard again, in front of Harvard Harvard's John Harvard stanch, statue, and also, you know what? One of the things we can look at. Are the, the banners. The yes, banners let's take wonderful. a look at the banners in Harvard Yard. And at first we see, you see their red banners and you see the shield of both the undergraduate houses as well as the various colleges. So on your left, you'll see the castle or the rook if you play <laughs> chess, uh, which is the shield of the school, uh, the dental school, the school of dental medicine. And to the right, you see the shield of the Harvard Business School. And next we are going to see the, where do we have? Okay, who's behind that? Uh, well, if you look think, on the left. I think we have the extension school coming up next. I think they'll prepare the shop for the extension school. But these banners, which are shields, on the, on the banners are the shields of the schools and the houses which are, are a way of identifying the different schools in a number of different ways. So yes, a, a and scroll. now we're beginning, we will see now on the left, the, the, the shield of the extension school, and or the School of Continuing Education, which by the way, this year had nearly 2,000 graduates, 2,000 students earning their degrees. And then to the right of the extension school, we see the the banner of the School of Public Health. Right, you saw that it was on the screen before. It was before. to the right with the Florida de Lis. And, and what I think we'll see next is the engineering school. There we have it uh, with the, the black cross uh, underneath. The School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and Applied otherwise Sciences. As, known as SEAS. Which celebrated this year inaugurating a new building that is phenomenal in, in what it's going to do for developing the sciences at Harvard even further than what Harvard has done so far. And so, the next one we have is the law school, the new law school ship. Oops, no, we're going to the medical school. Medical school, sure. Next one we have with the lion is the Harvard Medical School, the symbol of Harvard Medical School, which is, of course, the oldest medical school in the country. So it has the, it has the lion, the, the beautiful right. lion. And, and now we move to the law school, which says... And this is a, this is a new this is a new shield. This is a brand new school. shield, just inaugurated, I believe, in the last couple of weeks, which is said Lex S et Justitia. And then to the right of that, we have the uh, Graduate School of Education, the shield of the Graduate School of Education. Right, and then, and again, these 
Shields themselves take on a meaning for the graduates, for the Harvard graduates of those schools, <clears throat> and, and becomes a symbol of how they've spent the time on campus together, and really does help to, uh, to join alumni together. It becomes a representation of the alumni status of these, uh, of these many people, these now over 400,000 graduates of and Harvard. now, next, we will see the uh, Graduate School of Design with the hatch. Um, there, on the left, the Graduate School of Design. And to the right, then, we have the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So those um, uh, graduates who uh, receive their Master's in Arts and Sciences or their PhD. And, and it's interesting that all of these banners will have Veritas on them, or most of them. Yes. Well, which is truth in, in, in Latin. But it was also not the original banner. It was drawn up yes. by, by early, early on, uh, but not used for many years. In fact, Veritas did not become the uh, the model of Harvard until later on. Now, coming up, I think we're, we're going to see the Kennedy School on the left, on, yes, on the left, and then the and Shield of Radcliffe, Radcliffe. on now, the right. One of the interesting things that I noticed today as alumni come back into the yard is they do look up at the banners and as if they're searching for their, their school and for the undergraduates, for the college alumni, their um, house banner. And so we're going to move now to the house banners. The first one we have on the left, Dunster House with the three stags and the antlers and to the right of Dunster House is Elliott House which you can recognize because it's right on the Charles River and so you see the waves of the ripples of Charles River on the Elliott House banner. Right and these are, are both river houses so they are both close to the river as is Dunster House. Yes, and, yes. And, and again many alumni will return this weekend to their houses to celebrate with their classmates who live with them in some cases with the college for four years. So it's quite a, a, a focal and, point for these reunion weekends to have alumni And here we there. have on the left Forzheimer House, uh, which is at Radcliffe. And to the right, we have Quincy House. My son was actually in Quincy House, so I recognize that shield. And we can note that Forzheimer House is the rename for those of uh, the Elmer, right. which was formerly North House and South House, and right. had been renamed Forzheimer. And Quincy House has a long history, but is one of the more newly renovated houses uh, of, of the river houses, and is really a spectacular place now. And I think Harvard spent a lot of effort, time, and money to make the living conditions for its students uh, first rate. And next we have Courier House on the left, and that is the tree, the, the yellow tree you see on the Courier House um, shield is the original Radcliffe. Uh, tree and so those of us who still have Radl Radcliffe scarves, Radcliffe bags, we all have the famous Radcliffe tree. So there you see Courier House, and then to the right you see Dudley House. Dudley House, as you know, Bill, is a place for those undergraduates who live off campus. That's the center of their activities. And, and brings a real Dudley focal House. point for them to come together on campus, even though they're living off campus, and be able to celebrate and connect with their fellow alumni while they're on campus. And I think coming up, we have the, the banners that represent Lowell House, which has a very distinctive yes. aspect to it, and it's a, a fist holding arrows. Three and arrows, then with that, yes. Mather House as well, and which is one of the Mather. newer houses at Harvard, and that it was uh, constructed in 1970. Yes. So yes. it's a, it has a, a history, maybe not as long a history as some of the other houses, but certainly story. And uh, my son lived in Mather House oh, as well, so not, not Quincy there House, like yours, but Mather House is also a, a, a remarkable place. And, uh, and we should note while we're moving on that each one of these houses is headed by what is called a faculty dean, formerly known as a, a, a house master, but renamed faculty dean, yes. typically a faculty member or administration member and his or her, her partner who head the, uh, the social aspects of the house, but also the administrative aspects of the house, so that the students have a focal point that is faculty-oriented, uh, right and living in the house with them. And I remember my, I was in Leverett House, and the, um, the, what was then called the Master of Leverett House was the first 
graduate school professor. He's a professor at the business school, Ken Andrews. And when President Buck asked him to become master of Leverett, he said he would only do it if his wife could be called co-master because oh, okay. she was going to do all the work. And so from then on, it was the couple, whether the husband was the professor or the wife, it was considered a job for the couple, not just for the individual professor. All well, right, next think, up, we yeah. have Adam's house. Yeah, with Adam's the oak house leaves. And, and Cabot house. Cabot house with the cod, the right. three codfish. And, and Adam's house is near and dear to me. I spent three years living in Adam's house. And some of my classmates out there also lived near Cla uh, Adam's house as freshmen in Claverly. Oh, there you which are. Which, as a note, Claverly was housing freshmen in or first year students in 1973, which was the year before Canada was built. And the next year, first year students lived in Canada. So it's a, you know, it also, each one of these houses has its own special character that has changed over time because. The students are selected by lottery now, so they are, can go with the group. And I think coming up now... Well, we're going to have the Harvard, Harvard shield, shield on the left. So this is the shield for the university. And if people have forgotten what their house or school shield looks like, <laughs> nobody can forget Veritas. And to the, the right, we have Winthrop House, which is, once again, the regal lion with three red stripes. And so, again, when alumni come back, they look up because they're looking for the shield of their house and their school. So it's, it's quite a festive look. And, and last but not least, we have Winthrop House. Kirkland House, I think. Oh, sorry, Kirkland it? House. Sorry, Kirkland House with the three stars on blue. And, of course, Leverett House, which is where I lived for three years. And I was one of the first women to live in Leverett House. There were 400 men and 50 women. And it's the only time in my life when somebody says to me, were you a bunny? I say, absolutely, I was a bunny. Because those of us lived in Leverett House, male or female, Well, well I think our viewers might, might see the bunnies on that shield there. There that, you that, are. That the reference. There so, you are. That's a wonderful experience, I think, that we both had in our houses and we see that uh, you know we know that a lot of the reunions are focused on bringing those alums who are here back to their houses so that they can connect and I know I had, had uh, lunch today with one of my classmates who was in Adam's house with me and it's always great to be able to connect that way as well and and have uh, now if we could have the shot of the yard with all the banners what what is really so festive about having so many banners it really does add an air of festivity and specialness. Of course, throughout the year, the banners are not, the trees are there, but the banners are not there. So it's, there you can see a great shot. And then in the back on Widener Library, you see the large banners of the Veritas University, University Shield. Right, and we're seeing now that the, uh, the, the alumni in their groups are starting slowly to uh, to move into Tercentenary Theater. And I think there's a, an element here of, of, of festiveness that people are taking their time and coming in and, and anticipating being together with their, uh, with their, their classmates and, and others that are there. So here uh, we can see a, a shot of the 55th college reunion being uh, processing Welcome. into Tercentenary Theater. Class of 1957, coming in there, the 55th College Reunion. 57, no, it's 67, excuse right. me, class 67. of 67. Yeah. So as we see the 2022 version of the Alumni Parade, on this day of alumni celebration, we come together to enjoy one another's company and to remember those who have gone before us. This is a long tradition. The alumni parade we see today is a, is a long tradition of Harvard alumni walking together in the yard. And during Harvard's bicentennial year of 1836, the alumni festivities were particularly exuberant. Ralph Waldo Emerson of the Harvard class of 1821, so 200 years ago, wrote about the annual Harvard Alumni Parade on during the Bicentennial Festivities in July of 1836. And I am going to quote from Emerson's journal. Cambridge at any time is full of ghosts. 
But on that day, the anointed eye saw the crowd of spirits that mingled with the procession in the vacant spaces year by year as the classes proceeded. And then the far longer train of ghosts that followed the company of the men that wore before us the college honors and the laurels of the state. The long winding train reaching back into eternity. So today we can see the long winding train of alumni reaching back into eternity. I don't know about you, Bill, but for me, reciting that passage always gives me goosebumps. Maybe you could tell us about the oldest alumni who are with us today. Well, I'd like to add, Nancy, that Emerson conjures ghosts and emotes for us a strong sense of continuity, but a community that is more about people and ideas than just time. And as uh, Fair Harvard says, as truth on life's river floats by, that's what we're doing. So this sense of community is renewed by convening in this place, Tercentenary Theatre. Among those convening today are our oldest alumni. So we have, uh, and you can see some of them, uh, our older alumni assembly here with this shot that's right behind the stage. And the Crimson Society banner. So again, right. the Crimson Society is for those alum who have had their 50th reunion, but still come back and they are invited back to come to commencement every year. Right, and I think the comment was, after 50 years, we don't want to take the chance to wait another five years <laughs> right. to get together again. And I think people are enjoying themselves. They're connecting with each other. And among those alumni in the Crimson Society are the oldest alumni present today. So the oldest alumnus is Henry Lee, who's the class of 1948. So we welcome Henry back. And also the oldest alumna is Linda Black, who's the class of 1951. Wow. I know. So we're really it's glad amazing. to have them with us today. And you can see some of them congregating in front of you on the screen now uh, among the Crimson Society. Before we go ahead and talk more about alumni, let me talk to you a little bit about the music for the ceremony today. It is worth noting that the band and choir, both the band and choir, will be made up primarily, primarily of alumni. Students performed last week during commencement. This week, it's the alumni. And they will perform the Radcliffe alma mater, which I remember singing. Radcliffe, now we rise to greet thee, as well as the Harvard uh, song, Fair Harvard. So what's coming up now, or you can see on your screen, alumni uh, processing up the middle aisle of Tercentenary Theater to take their seats and await the ceremony. So there you see from behind and looking onto the stage. Uh, and you can see uh, that we've got a lot of people joining us today for this very first Harvard Alumni Day. And last week, we had a number of new alumni join us. And we had degrees conferred on students from Harvard College and the 12 graduate schools. And among them, Harvard College had 1,505 uh, degree holders uh, received their degrees last week that included those who graduated uh, or uh, graduated in June, but also throughout the year, because not all Harvard College students, or students for that matter, graduate in May. So what we also saw was uh, the next largest number of graduates was the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, which had, which had over 1,000, in fact, 1,332 graduates. And through all the rest of the schools, the total number of, of graduates last year, as we mentioned before, was 8,870. Interestingly enough, 628 of the degrees were jointly conferred. Wow. So, for example, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences would jointly confer degrees with other schools where the students were participating, both graduate students and for the, the Bachelor of Science degrees, the undergraduate students. So even though today's joyous ceremonies are not commencement, the view from here certainly looks like a Harvard commencement. Bill, one of my favorite descriptions of commencement is from our dearly departed former university, Peter Gomes, who's presided over Memorial Church for more than 40 years. And here is what he wrote about commencement and it looks like today. Someone observing the rash, rather casual dignity of the day remarked that commencement is more like a lawn party. So here you see our lawn party in Harvard Yard 
than a ballet, and a less charitable but more astute observer suggested that the vast assemblage in formation in the old yard was very much like the wonderfully chaotic game of croquet with flamingos and hedgehogs in Alice in Wonderland. First time visitors to the scene are rather horrified at what appears to be rank confusion, but they remember that this is, after all, Harvard, where conformity, even of self-preservation, has been elevated to the rank of an original sin. That that it works at all is a tribute to patience and goodwill, and the general sense that come what day, come up May, the day is to be enjoyed. So, Bill, we can expect a happy but chaotic scene this afternoon. And in the late 18th century, elephants, mermaids, and mummies sometimes <laughs> appeared, but I don't think we'll see any of those today. And one more little known fact. Harvard's charter states that residents of Cambridge have the right to graze their livestock in Harvard Yard. So one year on Alumni Day, because I live here in Cambridge, I may show up with hungry sheep so they can munch on the grass during the festivities. That would cause chaos indeed. Well, I think, Nancy, if I could describe what's happening right now, we see a number of empty seats out there, but there's a real buzz in Tercentennial Theater right now. There you know, as is. we sit just off stage, we get a, I, I get a sense of how people are excited to be together. We've got the 25th reunion class that's uh, sitting right next to us here. Uh, you can see the band is, is performing and is creating this sense of ceremony. And again, alumni in the band. So for this first or this inaugural alumni day, it really is an important aspect of uh, of this whole day and making it a, a sense of what's what's important. Now there is something I think Nancy, if we could get a shot of, of Nancy sitting sitting beside me here, uh, this is very interesting that you're wearing this hat. I'm very familiar with this hat that you're wearing, Nancy. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more of what made you come to wear this hat today. So, Bill, you and I are members of the. Happy observance of commencement committee. And I must say, when I was invited to a, join a committee that's called the Happy Committee, I didn't have to think twice. <laughs> and since 1869, alumni volunteers have organized the alumni celebrations. And the men, because in 1869 it was men, they wore top hats. Well, can I show you what that means? Yes. Oh, there's the top hat. There so, we are. See, we Bill had the top hat. And so they have uh, hosted the picnic lunches, escorted on Iran's, managed the crowds, and marshaled the alumni. Currently, there are 85 members on the Happy Committee, of you, which you and I are members. Women who are not required to, jo to wear top hats joined the committee in the late 1980s. And dressed in black, Happy Committee women wear the crimson satin La Follette rosette that you see here, designed by Ellen La Follette of the great class of 1954, based on the cockade that Revolutionary War soldiers wore on their tri-cornered hat. But beginning in, 1913, in 2013, women have been invited to wear their own version of the top hat, which I had the privilege to design, complete with feathers, recycle, from birds raised and killed for their food. But as I understand, Nancy, the, the idea for this hat did not conjure itself from nothing. There, there's a story behind this as well. Yes, so <laughs> I've been a member uh, of the Happy Committee since the late 1980s, and it was in 2006 that I was supposed to be on duty uh, in Harvard Yard at um, 6.30 in the morning, but my ticket said 6.45. So I had to stand at Thayer Gate and wait till 6.45. And all these men in their top hats walked through. The guards didn't ask for their tickets. And I said, never again. So I found this hat, which was all Radcliffe red at the time. I added the black ribbon, the black feathers, and started wearing it in 2007. And Bill, so many women came up to me and asked, where did I get the hat? Could they have a hat like that? I found a Milner in Jamaica Plain, which is a suburb, uh, one of the neighborhoods of Boston. And so this Milner now makes the official Harvard Women's Commencement hat. 
And the reason we wear these hats, the reason we, you wear the top hats, the black top hats, is that we are the ones who know where to get water, where they, where various seating is, where the graduate schools are, where the undergraduate houses are, as well as, most importantly, maybe where the restrooms are. <laughs> and so we're very visible when we wear our top hats. So now we have men's top hats and women's women's top hats. So. So I think if we we can move to a shot of the stage right now, it's a good opportunity uh, to talk a little bit about uh, about Tracy K. Smith. She's our inaugural Alumni Day speaker today, and she's a two-term U.S. Poet Laureate who's used poetry to bridge differences and build a community, and will be featured today at Alumni Day. As the 22nd Poet Laureate of the U.S. from 2017 and 2018, her three-decade career as a poet and her work championing poetry's critical social value have made Smith a powerful cultural voice on a national stage. And last year, Smith returned to Harvard from a position she held at Princeton, taking a new role of professor of English and African uh, and American studies and African-American studies at the, the Susan S. and Kenneth L. Wallach, as the Susan S. and Kenneth L. Wallach professor at the Radcliffe Institute. So as Vanessa Liu, the current president of the HAA, has said, at a time when so many of us are looking for ways to connect and more importantly, ways to understand and remedy the deep divides we see everywhere, I know our alumni will listen with great interest and care to the words of one of America's most treasured poets. And as an educator and lyricist, and I think this is important, Nancy, of the human condition, Tracy K. Smith is a powerful example of how Harvard alumni are transferring and transforming their expertise, their experience, empathy, and artful reflections on our world and to imagine a better world. Smith's ties to the university include being elected by alumni to serve on the Board of Overseers, one of Harvard's uh, two governing boards. And we'll note later on when we talk about the Overseers, she had to give up that position when she became a faculty member because Overseers are not allowed to be uh, associated as faculty members, uh, although elected by alumni. So she was also elected by her classmates to the role of Chief Marshal in 2019 for her 25th reunion. And the same year, received the prestigious Harvard Arts Medal. So we're looking forward today to, uh, to the, Harvard, the first Harvard alumni speech of this uh, global alumni day today. So we also had two speakers last week on Thursday and Sunday. Maybe tell us a little bit about what Merrick Garland had to tell us on, on so, uh, Sunday. Attorney General Merrick Garland, who's a member of the Harvard class of 1974 and the Harvard Law School class of 1977, spoke last uh, Sunday to the combined classes of 2020 and 2021. He made a plea for more graduates to embrace public service for at least some part of their lives at a time when the nation's democratic institution face historic threat. He said, among other things, don't let your generation be defined by the pandemic in the address that was both personal and often impassioned. Let it be defined by public service. He touched on the recent mass shootings, calling them horrific attacks by gunmen in Uvalde, Texas, Laguna Woods, California, and Buffalo, New York. He, quote, he said, these tragedies only underscore how urgent the call to public service for your generation truly is. And while there are many ways to serve and many problems to solve, the ongoing threats to democracy and democratic institutions, both in the U.S. and abroad, make the need for broad participation especially urgent, he said. So that was a very inspiring speech that he gave last Sunday. And last Thursday at our commencement, Bill, tell us about the speaker that day. Well, I'd just like to point out, too, in, in light of Merrick Garland's comments, that we were sad to hear that one of our alumni uh, passed away in the recent shooting in in texas so we're very sad to have to report that but uh, it is unfortunate but uh, i think merrick garland very very much touched a, on a point that's important to us jacinda ardern also has that uh, experience but when she she used her commencement address as a call to action against the erosion of trust 
in, in urging social media reforms as well as an end to tribalism. So, you know, after the, she went on to say, after the 1787 uh, Constitutional Convention, ben, Benjamin Franklin was asked whether the U.S. would be a monarchy or a republic. And he was quoted as saying, a republic if you can keep it. And one of the interesting things about that is that Benjamin Franklin was the first person to receive an honorary degree from Harvard. In the year 1753, he received the honorary degree for his scientific experiment, experiments, mostly related to electricity. And I'm told, history says, that his father did not want him to attend Harvard, so he went on to other illustrious uh, endeavors. And yet he got his degree from Harvard nonetheless. Exactly. Ultimately, he got it. That's right. That's right. So. Uh, after, uh, you know, two centuries later, Ardern went on to say, drawing a closer tie to the, the present, Pakistani, former pra Pakistani president, pr uh, Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, who's also uh, a Harvard alumna. Class of uh, 1973. And, correct, and unfortunately was assassinated in Pakistan. But she echoed Franklin's warning in saying, we must realize that democracy can be fragile. So. Uh, Jacinda Ardern offered a similar reminder, reminder at commencement last Thursday, updating the theme for our times. And what she said was, when facts and fiction have become a matter of opinion and trust that underlies democracies, is being eroded, blind faith in the resilience of democratic governance is short-sighted, she said. And I think I'm very strongly made that point. And she laid part of the blame for misinformation on social media platforms, the companies that run them, and the algorithms that create internet echo chambers. She was quoted as saying, the time has come for social media companies and other online providers to recognize their power and to act on it. And she, her government passed restrictions very, uh, very soon after uh, restrictions on semi-automatic firearms and high capacity magazines soon after uh, the killings in New Zealand a number of years ago. And Ardern pointed out that individuals also bear responsibility. How we use technology is an individual decision, she said, as is how we interact with those with whom we disagree. The resolution is that empathy is an appropriate response to help difference, not create divisiveness. And Bill, as you know, President Harvard President Larry Bathhouse spoke at both last Thursday's commencement for the class of 2022, as well as Sunday's ceremony for the classes of 2020 and 21. He spoke with reminders of troubled times, the war in the Ukraine, illness, mass, mud, uh, mass murder in Buffalo and Texas. He said it was impossible not to address those issues. He began the ceremonies with a moment of silence for those for whom these days are days of heartbreak and loss. He later acknowledged that some people who might have attended both of the day ceremonies may not have come either because of pandemic, fears of pandemic, because of travel restrictions. And uh, there was one of the honorary degree recipients who did not come because he was in Ukraine feeding the hungry there. Baka welcomed the sight of so many graduates, their parents, and their friends in a celebration. And one of the funny parts, ironic parts, was Harvard, for the first time in its history, had difficulty getting enough chairs for commencement because of supply chain issues. But it, re met, it reminded alumni that they would always have a seat here in Harvard Yard in Tercentenary Theater for the alumni celebrations. And finally, for the class of 2022, President Bacow concluded his remarks with the following. Today, I want to challenge you, members of the class of 2022, to save a seat for others, to make room for others, to ensure that the opportunities afforded by your education do not enrich your life alone. He said, you will have more chances than most to make a difference in the world, more opportunities to give others a chance at a better life. Take advantage of those opportunities when they arise.
And we can see now, Nancy, a, a pan view of the stage, and the seats are, are slowly filling up. Uh, you can see on the far left of the screen is where the band is located. And they're, they're playing there on the stage are a number of uh, dignitaries. We go in. Uh, but maybe I could just go through quickly a few of the events that have impacted Harvard over the, over the last year. First and foremost was the COVID impact and response. I mean, we saw a dramatic change when one week to the next, <clears throat> the class of 2020 was sent home at spring break to going through a, a full year uh, and of remote learning that was a remarkable response by faculty administration, but most of all the students who showed uh, an unbelievable resilience in being able to uh, function during that period of time. Wait a minute, I'm going to oh, interrupt good. you. We good. have such a great shot there yeah. of these are either students or young alumni who are doing the drumming for the band. And I have to say here, I've been through many commencement, it is a, the, the music here is fabulous. It's very loud and it really does serve to underscore the importance of the day. It, well, it gives a real feel a real alumni feel to hear the you know 10,000 men of Harvard playing now, so we can we can really get a sense of what that means and and how I'm sure a lot of alumni are in their seats right now humming along, either in the with the English version or the Latin version of 10,000 men there of Harvard. There they are. There's yep. another view of the band. Ah, there you we see, see the front row singing along too. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, I think this is this is part of the ceremonial aspect that alumni are going to, I'm sure, enjoy for decades to come of being able to gather. Now, here we go. You can hear now them dancing. So over the last year, Nancy, uh, Harvard went through a number of different things. Inclusion and diversity stays, stays foremost in the minds of the, her, uh, of the university and Larry Bacco. He brought that with it, with him through his, his experiences at Tufts and other institutions and the importance of uh, inclusion and diversity. There was an important presidential committee on Harvard and the legacy of slavery that released a report on April 26th of this year that described uh, basically the history that began with the colonial era, era, era embrace of slavery, and provided uh, some specific recommendations for how to proceed from here. Another I'm going to just ask if we could get a shot of, of Widener from the stage. If we could show the, the yep. there, that's it. Yes, let's take a look at that. There you and, are. And See, there that's we... a beautiful shot there of what it looks like from here. Please go ahead. Oh, Bill. sure, sure. But I think it's a good point, Nancy. We can see what the view of those dignitaries on stage have, and how we, we can see alumni gathering there. So another important uh, point in Harvard's future was the task force on the future of teaching and learning, and. It began by identifying the infrastructure and expertise that made it possible for Harvard to swiftly pivot to online instruction, which was a necessity and now is becoming a way of looking at how to provide education in general. Uh, an important thing coming up in the fall for alumni to know to note is the Supreme Court case on admissions that will be heard in the fall. The three key points that the Harvard Alumni Association would like alumni to take away is that diversity is more important today than ever. Forty years of court decisions support higher education admissions policy where race is one of many factors and should be encouraging diversity and consideration of the whole person. And thirdly, before the, this case goes to the Supreme Court, two lower courts have found that Harvard does not discriminate in admissions. The reason I mention these things now, Nancy, is that it was profoundly put by our provost, Alan Garber, who's also class of 1977, who said one of the most important things alumni can do is be informed about the things that are happening at Harvard and the things that affect Harvard, because those affect us as well. And one of the important things to know about the admissions, the Harvard admissions case, is Bill Lee, William Lee, former head of the... Um, corporation, the Harvard Corporation, is receiving a Harvard Medal today for his alumni service to the university. Bill is a class of, from the class of 1972, and he is celebrating, along with his classmates, his 50th reunion today, right. this and, and, weekend. And also as, a, as the, the lead of the Harvard Corporation, right? right? And, and is stepping down this year and will be replaced by Penny Pritzker, who's class of 1981. But in addition, we will see on stage today Harvard medals uh, presented in addition to uh, Bill Lee, Avarita Hansen, class of 75, 
uh, Tom Reardon, class of 68, who founded the Harvard Veterans Shared Interest Group, and Dwight D. Miller, who's a, ed, a graduate school of education class of 1971, who is for decades, over 50 years, uh, a member of the Harvard Admissions Committee, and has seen 50 years worth of Harvard alumni admitted to Harvard College, and is beloved, and also has an award named in his honor now for schools committees across the world. And he was also, for many years, a proctor in Harvard Yard. Right, and got to know students. So yes. it just, just when we're looking at, at these, uh, we, we can, other things that have happened recently, we had an election of overseers and elected directors. So we have seven new overseers who've been elected to uh, take their place among the to a total of 30 overseers uh, that are responsible for visiting committees and uh, basically looking after the idea of how education is furthered at Harvard. We are about to start as soon as we hear the bells. We'll hear the bells of Memorial, Memorial Church. Memorial Church will ring. We'll start and the to meeting ring. will begin momentarily. Please, and please keep your eyes open. It will be Vanessa Liu, who's the current president of the Harvard Alumni Association, will start things off by pounding the gavel and in front of the dignitaries that include the Harvard medalists who are on stage. They include uh, also uh, on stage, you'll see Paul Finnegan, who's the Harvard treasurer, also an alumnus, class of 1975. And a member of the corporation. And a member of the corporation as well. As well as on the stage, you're seeing an assembled group of overseers, Harvard elected directors, and also members of the executive of the Harvard Alumni Association. So this is a, a, an august group. There you see walking off the stage right now, Mark Goodhart, who's the secretary of the Harvard Corporation. And uh, we will see the Harvard medalists who will be in the first row presented with their medals uh, and in, in a very appropriate way. So at this point, what we'd like to do is say thank you. Join us again after the end of the annual meeting. And we'll provide you with a little bit of a, a wrap up and a summary. But thank you for joining us today and on to the annual meeting. Enjoy the meeting and we will be back afterwards. Good afternoon, President Bacow, members of the Harvard Corporation and the Board of Overseers, Professor Smith, members of the faculty, honored guests, fellow alumni, volunteer leaders, new graduates, family and friends. Welcome to the inaugural Harvard Alumni Day and the 100 and... and the 152nd annual meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association. My name is Vanessa Liu. I'm a native New Yorker, former Dunster House resident from the great, <laughs> from the great Harvard College class of 1996, and a member of the Harvard Law School class of 2003. As the president of the Harvard Alumni Association, and in accordance with the tradition set by our very first Alumni Association president, 
John Quincy Adams from the class of 1787, I raise this gavel and call this meeting to order. <laughs> from its origins, our Harvard alumni community has been anchored and enriched by First Nations people from across the Americas and around the world. The land on which Harvard is situated has been a place of learning for millennia, where First Nations people have passed on their culture, history, and traditions from one generation to the next. I acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the place in which we meet, the people of the Massachusetts tribe and their elders, past, present, and emerging, and honor the land itself which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. I acknowledge and pay my respects to the Nipmuc and Wampanoag peoples with whom Harvard has a long historical relationship. And I acknowledge and pay my respects to all the First Nations elders who are here today. I'm back. On behalf of the Harvard Alumni Association, thank you so much for joining us today for this university-wide and global alumni event honoring your impact, citizenship, and community. Whether you're joining us, us here today um, in the Centenary Theater or remotely via the live stream, and let's wave to all those folks on the live stream who are viewing at home, thank you and welcome. It is incredible to see everyone gathered here today around the world, online and also here. And while today is a day of joy and celebration for our alumni community, we're also mindful that for many, there has been much loss and pain in the three years since we have gathered. So before we begin today's program, let's us take a moment of silence to remember those who are no longer with us. So a moment of silence, please. Thank you. To kick things off, I'd like to share this short video on the screens here, highlighting some of our most committed volunteers around the globe. renowned for academic scholarship, research, and intellectual discovery. Harvard is also you, me, and our entire alumni community. We are the foundation that has helped shape and build the Harvard we know and love today. Just like the alumni who came before us. Our community includes leaders of all kinds who have made the modern history. And today we continue to expand that impact as we bring our passion our wisdom, and our leadership to cities and countries across the globe. Whether in schools or laboratories, courtrooms or corporations, museums or hospitals, libraries or concert halls, our collective work changes the world every day, especially as we welcome new alumni into our ranks each year. As alumni, it's our responsibility to work together to ensure that all members of our community feel like they belong by giving back our time to know. We help make Harvard the best it can be. Since our first days on campus, Harvard has been our home. No matter where we come from, and no matter what Harvard school we graduated from, 
we will always be connected, all 400,000 of us. So, on Harvard's inaugural Alumni Day, we celebrate you. Alumni from across the university and around the globe. Today is a momentous occasion for our entire community. Because today we celebrate what it means to be a part of the Harvard alumni community together. Hoy es una ocasión extraordinaria porque hoy celebramos lo que significa ser miembros juntos de nuestra comunidad de egresados y egresadas de Harvard. Nasi zvakuru katino pemberera zvatiri sevana ve Harvard. Harvard alumni day. Today is a momentous occasion for our entire community because today we celebrate what it means to be part of the Harvard alumni community together. One of you is part of a remarkable global community of Harvard alumni that is over 400,000 strong. By creating Harvard Alumni Day, we wanted to start a new tradition, setting aside a full day to celebrate each other and our incredible community. The notion of community is more important than ever. These are times of uncertainty and turmoil. I, I wish I could say that the times we're living in are better than when we graduated, but for many of us, it isn't. We are in a time of crisis. We have been grappling with the health crisis the pandemic has created, which has led to tragic personal losses and psychological and emotional trauma. Many of us and our friends, neighbors, colleagues and families, including my own, are experiencing racial injustice and increasing instances of racially motivated hate. We have to have heartbreaking conversations with our children about how to prepare for school shootings. We are in a climate crisis that hasn't even reached its crescendo, and we are witnessing a humanitarian crisis at a level not seen in Europe since World War II. At moments over the last three years since we've gathered, it has been overwhelming and sad. But giving up in despair is not an option. I've always admired Harvard College's formal mission to educate the citizens and citizen leaders of our society. As alumni, those roles as citizens and citizen leaders are ever more crucial. Over the last year, I've been reflecting on what it means to be a citizen and citizen leader educated by Harvard. And there are three components. First, it's about embracing and having empathy for differences. When we were here as students, we were immersed in a sea of differing ideas, differing perspectives, differing beliefs, differing cultures, differing interests. And we learned so much from that diversity. We were taught to ask questions and to seek out those with different views so we could learn from them. In our dining halls, it was commonplace to see table combinations, including an atheist, a Muslim, a conservative, and a liberal sitting together. When we graduated, we were expected to make our mark on history, not as like-minded thinkers, but as individuals who are respectfully open to opposing views while standing up for our beliefs. For democracy to prevail, we have to make sure we continue to hone the skills of civil discourse with integrity. Our 400,000 strong alumni community should be a model for this. Second, it's about celebrating our collective commonality. I was 14 years old when I learned firsthand the power of commonality. I was chosen to go to the USSR as part of a student delegation with NASA. And yes, I was a total space nerd. That's a story for another day. And this was still in the midst of the Cold War. And we were being taught through the media that Russians were the enemy. When I got to the USSR and visited school after school, I was prepared to be defensive with those from the other side. Instead, 
I bonded with students who shared an admiration for Duran Duran, Billy Joel, and Stevie Wonder. As humans, we thrive on connecting, and that makes us want to help one another. In moments of uncertainty, in moments of turmoil, finding a connection with someone you thought of as the other makes all the difference. Third, and finally, it's about taking action towards positive change. In these difficult times, we need to stand up for one another and work together to be the catalysts of the world we want to see. Our Harvard alumni community has stepped up meaningfully these last few years, coming together in new and unexpected ways. When the pandemic hit, Alumni came together to launch a pan-university disaster preparedness and response team, setting up medical hotlines for classmates and their families. After the murder of George Floyd, alumni formed an anti-racism working group and allyship series over Zoom, supported by over 100 Harvard clubs around the world, stretching from Boston to Ireland to Oceania to Japan and beyond. As the current refugee crisis unfolds in Ukraine, alumni around the world have rallied together to provide remote work opportunities for those who have fled. It's been inspiring to watch our alumni community create points of intervention to lift each other up. As citizens and citizen leaders, we must act on behalf of others, not just ourselves. It takes work on all of our parts to be one Harvard not just for our alumni community, but for society. As I round out my time as president of the Harvard Alumni Association, here's my challenge to you. Embrace differences, celebrate collective commonality, and take action. Honor your roles as citizens and citizen leaders, and come together not only for fun, like today, but to shape the world we want to live in and forge a brighter path forward. Now let's dive into some extra special folks in our midst. Our, com our community spans our new university admits all the way to our eldest alumni, many of whom join us in celebration today as part of the newly launched Crimson Society, an organization to celebrate all Harvard College and Radcliffe College alumni, alumni every year on campus starting the year after their 50th reunion. I'm personally so excited about Crimson Society as I've seen it hatch from an idea in a meeting room to become an annual program alumni can come back to campus for in between reunion years. Leading the Radcliffe alumni today is Linda Black, of the Radcliffe class of 1951, who will turn 94 in December. <laughs> and from the Harvard College class of 1948, we have, we have, Stanley, is it Henry, Henry, Henry Lee, who is 97, joining us today from Boston. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda and Henry, for leading our alumni parade. It's an honor to celebrate with you today. Your many years of participation in the HAA are a great reminder for our new graduates that their Harvard experience is just beginning. And indeed, your presence here today brings us all so much joy and meaning. I would like to welcome our college reunion chair seated on stage with us. This dedicated group of alumni volunteers represent 14 reunion classes and lead our reunion efforts for our alumni and our university. Today, we applaud, um, at, like we applaud incredible, um, sorry, we're just like going around. Well, I just want to acknowledge our partnership with the Graduate School Alumni Councils and the important community building they are leading across the university. 
Also joining us on stage today is the HAA Board of Directors. <laughs> Representing our 14,000 volunteers and global alumni community and members of the Harvard Governing Boards from the Harvard Corporation and Board of Overseers. There is one former overseer who's not on stage with us, but is in our front row, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. We are so proud of you. <laughs> well, thank you. To <laughs> thank you to everyone for your commitment to this community, and that's her class cheering right there. <laughs> three years since we've last gathered together here at this meeting in person to celebrate our alumni community. And during that time, alumni from the classes of 2020, 2021, and most recently, 2022, have joined the alumni ranks. <laughs> These alumni faced a time like no other during their student experience at Harvard. We celebrated them last Thursday and Sunday here in this very spot. And for the classes of 2020 and 2021, it was also their first reunion. So today on behalf of this global and university-wide network, we wholeheartedly and enthusiastically welcome you to the alumni community. On July 1st, I will pass the torch of HAA leadership to an alumna who embodies what it means to be a citizen leader and has tirelessly contributed to our alumni community. She is a member of the college class of 1990, also Dunster House, I must say, <laughs> and holds a master's in landscape architecture from the Graduate School of Design. She is a former chair of the GSD Alumni Council and has held many roles on the HAA's board of directors over the years, including that of director from the design school and vice president representing the graduate school directors. Allison will be the first graduate of the design school to serve as HAA president. I know she will be a terrific leader. HAA president-elect Allison Mendenhall, will you please stand? We recently concluded the spring's elections for Harvard's Board of Overseers and the elected directors of the Harvard Alumni Association. And I hope you saw the results in the Harvard Gazette last week. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating these 13 individuals on their new Harvard volunteer roles. We are grateful to all of the candidates for their willingness to be of service to Harvard. And thank you to each of you who voted and participated in the election process that is integral to our work as alumni. I just wanted to talk very briefly about the process. Harvard community leaders and members, including many alumni like you, sent hundreds of nominations for Harvard's 2022 elections. There are 13 alumni members of the nominating committee who each serve a three-year three term. Throughout the past year, the committee reviewed all submissions for candidates carefully, narrowing down the pool to nine candidates for Harvard Overseer 
and nine for HAA elected director. So as a reminder, in addition to voting, you can also participate in the nominating process by submitting names on our website to be considered by the nominating committee. So I'd strongly encourage you to participate. Some of the most thoughtful nominations come from our alumni community. Now, one of the most important traditions marked by all 25th Reunion College classes is the election of the Chief Marshal of Alumni. I have a feeling that's where the 25th <laughs> Reunion class is sitting. So this year's Chief Marshal has spent her career helping us understand racial injustice, its complex human cost, and how its history is something that links and impacts all of us. She is a historian and storyteller, teacher and scholar, academic and community builder. She is an associate professor in Stanford University's Department of History, director of African and African American Studies, and a Kleinheitz University Fellow in Undergraduate Education. In her 25th class report, she wrote, I became a college professor because I never wanted to leave college. <laughs> and she has received the most prestigious teaching award at Stanford. Her 2014 book, A Chosen Exile, A History of Racial Passing in American Life, has won numerous prizes, including the Organization of American Historians Frederick Jackson Turner Prize for the best debut book in American history and the Lawrence Levine Prize for Best Book in American Cultural History. She is an example of the countless Harvard alumni who are shaping our world like all of the chief marshals before her. It is my pleasure to recognize our chief marshal for alumni, author, scholar, and educator, and member of the great Harvard College class of 1997, Allison Hobbs. Thank you so much for such a generous introduction. President Bacow, Provost Garber, thank you so much for your visionary leadership of our great university. I am so grateful to be in the presence of university leadership, friends of Harvard, Harvard medalists, Harvard alumni, Ms. Vanessa Liu, Mr. Philip Lovejoy, my absolute favorite poet, Professor Tracy K. Smith, and esteemed guests. Before I give my brief remarks, I want to tell a short story about my life as a professor at Stanford. My students often use language that I don't understand because I am very, very old, and they are very, very young. <laughs> One of their favorite words that they say all the time to talk about someone who they especially love is fangirl. Now, I didn't know what fangirl meant until I watched the confirmation hearings and met for the first time today, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. It is an incredible honor to stand before you today to serve as the Chief Marshal of the Alumni and to represent my class, the extraordinary and incomparable class of 1997. Okay. So 
So as many of you may know, in 2019, President Bacow charged a committee with uncovering Harvard's ties to slavery. The report of the Presidential Committee on Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery begins with a statement that casts a bright light on the central value and the highest ideal of this university, truth. The report's headline states that, quote, Harvard's motto, Veritas, inscribed on gates, doorways, and sculptures all over campus, demands of us truth. The report continues, the work of excavating and confronting truths is a community-wide endeavor that will result in a reckoning with the past. As I read the report, I was struck by its revolutionary and groundbreaking scholarship, by the historical context that anchors it, and by its unpleasant and even brutal honesty. If we didn't already know it, we know it now. Harvard benefited from the labors of enslaved people. Later, Harvard actively and unapologetically segregated its students. And Harvard engaged in unfair admissions policies that favored the wealthy and the elite. This report revealed these painful truths, and by doing so, the committee answered the call of our university's highest ideal. There is so much more work to do. Veritas is an insistence. It is a call to action in urging and a clamoring for us to produce scholarship that opens our eyes to histories that we have not known and stories that we could not see. It also demands that we use this research to bridge the gap between the academy and the larger public. Our country is breaking apart. Some people have gone as far as to say that it is broken. Our democracy is hanging in the balance. Truth is under siege. During these tumultuous times and in this political climate, understanding history and being guided by scholarship, research, and truth is more urgent than ever. As Harvard alums, we are all dreamers. We are all imagining a world where there is more justice, more equality, greater freedom, better health care, and the human right for basic safety. Sometimes it feels like these dreams may not come true. They may seem naive, even childlike. But then we can look at our brilliant, talented, compassionate, and empathetic classmates and alums who are driven by an uncommon courage and conviction. We can feel inspired by the countless ways that they are working hard to change this world. Our classmates make it plain that Veritas is not just a motto carved in stone, but a work in progress. We can take comfort in knowing that we will face this work. We will confront all that needs to be done together as a community of citizens. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Alice, and those were beautiful words. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the 29th president of Harvard University, Lawrence Bacow. <laughs> So those who've had the privilege of meeting President Baca will know that he insists on being called Larry and has a very hands-on approach to life on campus. It was actually my husband, Harold, who had given me a heads up about this because years ago when he was doing a joint Fletcher de uh, degree at the Fletcher School at Tufts um, while also here at Harvard Law, President Bacow, who was then president at Tufts, was known for organizing a regular running group of students. And when we got together in the fall, right before convocation, he shared how he and his wonderful wife, Adele, had helped students get settled, actually carrying boxes through, uh, through entryways and relishing in a campus that was finally full after almost 18 months. And over the last week, under his leadership, the university was able to not only celebrate the class of 2022, but also welcome back over 90% of the classes of 2020 and 2021 for the long overdue commencements. Over the last two years, President Bacow has admirably and successfully navigated the university through a once in a lifetime challenge posed by the pandemic. Though travel to alumni communities has yet to resume, President Bacow has been a fixture on Zoom, sharing the impactful work the university has been doing tackling the climate crisis, unveiling future plans for Alston, which you should definitely go and check out if you have the chance to do so, and just recently, addressing Harvard's extensive history and entanglement with slavery and creating a plan with a $100 million commitment to redress injustices. A moral leader, President Backhouse's commitment to truth, Veritas, is inspirational. It is my honor to invite to the podium Harvard's 29th president, Larry Bacow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, Vanessa, thank you very much for that very, very generous um, introduction and also for your steadfast leadership over this past year um, of this alumni association. It's, you know, we appreciate all that you've done for us, for your leadership, for your good work in bringing us all together and keeping us as strong as we've ever been, but even more importantly, as strong as we need to be. So thank you. I have to say, this is actually a wonderful sight. It's, it's wonderful to be back together with all of you here in the heart of this amazingly beautiful campus. On a lovely day, the sun's coming out for, for us all. Not too much sun, it's not too hot, it's not too cold. Um, it's, it's just right. Um, and while Zoom does many, many things well, one of the things that it also taught us is how good it is to all be together in person. And it's great to be together with all of you today. So thank you. So a few weeks ago, I was interviewed at the um, Economic Club of Washington, DC. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I should tell you, my interviewer was David Rubenstein, who happens to be a member of the Harvard Corporation. So I expected it to be a pretty friendly interview. Um, and uh, David asked me a question, uh, which I didn't know was coming. And actually, it was a question which I had never been asked before as president. Now, one of the interesting things about being president of Harvard is that you get asked the same questions over and over and over again. But nobody had ever asked me uh, this question. So um, I thought I would repeat it to you. Uh, he said, what accounts for Harvard's extraordinary 
reputation. He said, the United States is blessed with many great colleges and universities, um, but Harvard stands apart. It stands out. Um, it's different. Why? Why? Um, and, you know, I, I agreed with him. I've been fortunate to be at a few other pretty good institutions. You know, I spent 24 years on the faculty down the street um, at MIT. Um, and thanks for the shout out to Tufts and to the Fletcher School. Ten wonderful years at, at, at Tufts. Um, so I know this, what David says is actually uh, true. But this place does stand apart. Harvard enjoys worldwide recognition, actually almost universal recognition, literally any place in the world. And David just wanted to know why. Why was that the case? So I thought about it for a little bit, and I, I wanted to share some of my responses to him and some that I've actually had more of an opportunity to reflect upon uh, since then. The first thing that I did was I talked about our faculty. They are among the most talented, accomplished scholars of their generation. And uh, they make, you know, important, often path-breaking contributions in literally every field, discipline, realm of knowledge uh, imaginable. And, you know, one of the amazing things about being president of this place is that I get to congratulate them on when they win awards. Uh, this is almost a full-time job. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't think a week has passed during my time at Harvard where I haven't penned notes uh, to faculty recognizing, you know, some major prize, um, a fellowship, an honor, election to some honorary society, uh, you know, the list is amazing. You know, Blavatnik, Carnegie, Guggenheim, Holberg, MacArthur, you know, Nobel Prizes, membership in, in the various national academies. I could go on. It actually, if I were to list them all, we would be here for a very long time, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, but that list of faculty honors and achievements is just one way of illustrating how amazing our faculty um, are, how important and valuable uh, their work is. If we just reflect upon the last two years alone, and I know we've already mentioned the pandemic, but I want to talk a little bit more about it. Um, Harvard was really on the front lines, uh, on the front lines of science, on the front lines of clinical care, on the front lines of helping the world and people understand what was actually going on, people explaining to others what they were experiencing during this extraordinary period in time. Uh, Harvard folks were in the trenches, um, sort of connecting people and resources to help us find a way forward, uh, despite what admittedly was a period of intense confusion and uncertainty. Uh, so I wanted to try and find a way to make this real to all of you. So uh, I'm a data junkie in my own scholarship. I've mucked around with data a lot. So. Um, I'm going to engage in some data collection here in real time. So I want all of you who either got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the Moderna vaccine to raise your hands, okay? If you did it, raise your hands, okay? Pretty impressive, um, isn't it? Thank you very much. Um, the shots that went into your arms literally originated at the Harvard Medical School. And I'm looking at the dean of the medical school as I, as I say this. You know, if you got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it came out of Dan Barusha's lab. Um, if you uh, got the Moderna vaccine, it had its origins in Derek Rossi's lab. And if that weren't enough, um, you know, Kismeka Cor Corbett, one of Time Magazine's Heroes of the Year in 2021, and now a faculty member at the Chan School of Public Health, um, was part of the team that developed the mRNA-based vaccine platform that made all of these vaccines um, and possible that accelerated really 
humanity's uh, response to this virus. Um, here's another example of the role that our faculty played uh, in all of this. Before she became director of the CDC, the Center for Disease Con Control, Rochelle Walensky was on our faculty um, and actually served on the university's coronavirus advisory group, the group that our provost, Alan Garber, uh, put together to try and help us navigate a pathway um, through this problem. She was one of its original members. Um, another longtime member of this uh, of the Harvard um, Chan School of Public Health faculty, uh, who later went on to go to lead the School of Public Health at Brown, Ashish Jha, is now in the White House um, coordinating our ongoing response to the pandemic. I can mention lots more Harvard faculty members who are involved, but these five, I think, represent the excellence that's really ever-present um, among our faculty, ever-present in their research and scholarship, Research and scholarship, which really makes a difference on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in this world. It deepens our knowledge and understanding of really difficult, challenging problems and, help us, and helps us to find a way forward. This university truly is home to some of the greatest minds of our time. Yet our faculty, as great as they are, are just part of the story. Um, our students are also among the very best in the world. And each of them, in addition to being terrific students academically, it seems like all of them also excel in something else outside the classroom. It's, it's really quite astonishing once you get to know them. You know, we have physicists who are also concert poets, or concert pianists, excuse me. We have, we, we have sociology majors, which turn out to be Tracy, pretty good poets. Amanda Gorman uh, did not did not concentrate in English. Um, so Amanda wrote poetry um, on the on the side. Um, we have, you know, students who are phenomenal athletes or world class chess players. Um, every year, just like the faculty, they are out there racking up award after award after award. You know, Rhodes, Marshalls, Trumans, Fulbrights, just to name a few. And guess what happens after four years? They become you, <laughs> alumni. And then they go out and they continue to make uh, a difference in the world. You are deserving heirs to a legacy of achievement. And if you ask me why Harvard enjoys this extraordinary reputation, it's because of our faculty, it's because of our students, but in the end, it's because of what you do. Um, you're making contributions to communities in almost every country on the planet. And literally, we have Harvard alumni living in every continent on the planet. Although here I have to add, only intermittently in Antarctica, you know, where our scientists go down there to help, help us understand about all sorts of things like climate change. Now, uh, in just about every field and discipline, just about every profession, you are making your mark. Uh, I'm, I'm really astonished when I travel to Washington, D.C., and I spend a lot of time in D.C. these days. And I go to visit members of Congress. And what's interesting there is that over 10% of the members of Congress have Harvard degrees, um, Republicans, Democrats, um, you know, we have them all over the place. Um, when I go to visit the White House, does not make any di difference which party is in control of the White House. I encounter Harvard alums um, in the cabinet, in sub-cabinet positions, um, everywhere. Um, and in state houses, and city halls, school committees, and countless other public officers, offices, Harvard alumni you guys are carrying on a tradition of public service that, it, that is as old as Harvard itself. And if you don't believe me, never forget eight of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Harvard alumni. Each spring, we commission a new crop of officers from our ROTC unit. 
And just last week, yep, absolutely. Just last week, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, stood right up here with me as we did just that. And every time we do it, I beam with pride at our Harvard graduates who wear the uniform of our nation and swear allegiance to the Constitution um, and demonstrate their devotion to this country, um, a devotion that has been shown similarly by generations of Harvard alums before them. And if you don't believe me, go in here and look at the wall. Um, I think it's also important that we should never forget that this institution, Harvard, has had more Congressional Medal, Medal of Honor recipients than any other school in the country except for the service academies and has contributed more sons and daughters in service to the nation than any other school other than our service academies. And that deserves a round of applause. When I go out west to Silicon Valley, um, where I, there's another school out there. I can't remember its name, Allison, but somewhere, somewhere there. Uh, you know, I encounter alums, Harvard alums, you know, who are starting new companies, who are inventing new technologies, um, who are creating new jobs, new opportunities um, for people. These are creative, imaginative alums who are, who are doing amazing work. And it really doesn't make any difference, no matter where I find it myself, whether or not I'm in Harvard Square or Trafalgar Square or any other square in the world, um, I have endless opportunities to meet your classmates, to, to meet, in many cases, some of you, extraordinary people who are doing well and doing good in the name of your alma mater. Now, actually, I don't even really need to leave my house if I want to, all I need to do is to turn on the TV, and I can also see the good work um, of our alums, you know, who are writing and directing and producing, you name it, sort of movies, TV shows, um, endless things. Harvard alums are everywhere. Um, I can go online and I can download literally any genre of music, and I guarantee you I can find a Harvard alum who has either written it or performed it. And I have to confess, I play a little game every Sunday when I read the book review section of the New York Times because I count literally how many books were either written or reviewed uh, by Harvard alums. And there are always a few there. Um, uh, there are always a few there. Um, and in fact, I have to com confess, I'm a sports junkie. You know, all I have to do is turn on the TV if I'm, you know, if I want to watch professional sports, and I can see Crimson athletes, you know, Harvard alums uh, in action. Who actually knew that Harvard University would become known as tight end U um, in in the National Football League? You know, um, so um, you know, thank you, Tim Murphy. And I also must confess, I'm a big hockey fan. And last year. I note this with pride, the Norris Trophy winner for the outstanding defenseman in the NHL was none other than Harvard's own Adam Fox playing for the New York Rangers. Yep. But, but now I have to tell you the rest of the story about Adam because only at Harvard would this happen. Adam actually left Harvard early to turn pro. And uh, when he won the Norris Trophy, I sent him an email uh, congratulating him. And I said, you know, Adam, I know it's great. You're at the pinnacle of your profession. But please find time to finish your Harvard degree. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to sound like a parent. Um, you'll never regret it. I got an email back from Adam in five minutes. And what did his email say? Well, this was in the middle of the pandemic. And he said, dear President Backow, because the NHL season started a little late and Harvard was teaching remotely, I enrolled full time. And he finished his Harvard degree while he was completing his season in the NHL. Only at Harvard um, would, that, uh, would that happen. 
So if you ask me what accounts for Harvard's outsized reputation, I think it is the outsized hope and aspirations um, of people, all of whom call Harvard our home. Um, it's their willingness, your willingness, to make a difference in the world, to really try and leave it a better place than you found it, and, and we are all better off for that. Um, during the past few years, I've really been inspired to sort of witness some of this uh, literally firsthand, because so many of you actually helped us through this pandemic. Just one example, which I think says everything. In the early days of the pandemic, when things were really pretty grim, and all of our hospitals were just jammed with people, um, and it was difficult to find a bed for folks, we had a critical shortage of personal protective equipment. Literally, we did not have enough masks to go around, and we had frontline hospital workers treating people with a terribly infectious disease and our inability to protect them um, from this disease itself. Our alumni in Asia, without us asking them, on their own, identified tons of personal protective equipment, acquired it, purchased it at their own expense, and then arranged to have it shipped to Harvard, shipped back here to Boston, on a plane that was made available by another Harvard alum. And it was those efforts that helped us get through um, this, this pandemic. Um, truly amazing. For all of you who helped us, I cannot, I cannot thank you enough. My hope for the years to come is that we continue to progress, both as individuals, but also as a community, um, that we continue to make progress on the really big issues of the day that I think we all need to work together if we're gonna make progress. What, do I, what am I speaking about? We need to work together to mend the divisions in this country that threaten our democracy. We need to... We need to work together to try and address the inequities, the inequality that were laid bare by this pandemic. We need to work collectively to, to address the challenges posed by climate change. And, and God knows, I hope we can find ways to work together to ensure that gun violence is understood and addressed as a true public health crisis. I remain optimistic that we can address these difficult, vexing problems because we are Harvard through calm and through storm. The world expects much of us because, as was so eloquently stated, Harvard stands for veritas, for truth, and the progress and possibility that that search for truth enables. I'm confident that we're going to meet the challenges of the moment just as those who preceded us did. I'm confident that we will pass on to our successors a Harvard that is worthy of the trust that humanity has placed in us, worthy of the reputation that we collectively enjoy. And that is our challenge. I'm really honored to be with all of you here today to mark the passing of what's been an extraordinary year by, uh, by any measure. Um, I want to extend my thanks to my president, Vanessa Liu. Um, I'm also an alum, so I can claim that. Um, for her leadership um, of this august body. Thank you, Vanessa.
Um, I also want to take a moment, though, to recognize two other presidents, also your presidents, to Alice Hill and John West, each of whom led the HAA through the pandemic, and, and I want them pleased to stand and be recognized because Alice and John We are indebted to both of these leaders, neither of whom had the privilege or opportunity to actually preside over an event like this um, in person. And I also want to give my thanks in advance uh, to Professor Tracy K. Smith. And I have to say, I really love saying Professor Tracy K. Smith of Harvard, because uh, she only joined us um, relatively recently from a university on, which exit is it on the New Jersey Turnpike, uh, Tracy? Somewhere in Southern Jersey, I don't know. Um, anyway, but we're glad that she finally uh, found her way home and we're all really looking forward to your remarks. And then um, finally, I also wanna thank Philip Lovejoy, um, who has given so much to this university since he arrived here in 1998, and so much more to this alumni association. I think, I think, as you all know, Philip has been the executive director of the HAA um, since 2004, and um, we are all better off because of his, his good efforts. And now, truly finally, um, many thanks again to each and every one of you for being here, for traveling long distances to be here, for making the effort to be here when we're still dealing um, with threats to, to public health. But also, thanks to each and every one of you for believing in the idea of Harvard, um, for working to ensure that future generations have the same opportunity that, we're, that was given to each and every one of us when we were privileged to come and, and study here. Uh, that's an important legacy that, that you, that we pass on to future generations, and we need to make sure it continues to be passed on to each and every one, each and every group of students, so they can assume their right place exactly where you're sitting to today. Thank you so much for the privilege of speaking today. Um, best of luck to each of you, and Godspeed. Thank you so much, President Bacow. To honor the contributions of Radcliffe College and its alumni, and to mark its historical significance for women and men alike, please stand and join in singing, Radcliffe, now we rise to greet thee. The words will appear on the screens.
each year we recognize the winners of the Harvard Medal. The Harvard Medal is among the highest honors awarded by the university and recognizes individuals who have given extraordinary service to Harvard. This year's four recipients who are all here today merit this recognition for their exemplary and inspirational commitment to our university. President Bacal will read the citations and I ask that each of the medalists please stand as your name is announced. I have to make sure I have the right one here. Yep. <laughs> of Rita L. Hansen, class of 1976. Five. This is what happens when I don't read my, with my glasses on. I'm sorry. Apologies, apologies, apologies. Let's try it again. Class of 1975. There we go. This way you got two applauses, two rounds of applause. Avarita Hansen, AB 1975. An exemplary and energetic volunteer, mentor, and community builder for more than four decades. You have devoted your life to uplifting others at Harvard and beyond, creating a thriving affinity, affinity space that has empowered countless black undergraduates and alumni and continually advocating for diversity, equity, and justice for all. Presentation of the Harvard Medal to William F. Lee, AB, class of 1972. <laughs> got it. I got it right. So I can't do this alone. I actually need some help. So I have two special helpers who are going to come forward and help me with the presentation. Uh, of this one, okay? <laughs> Julia Smith and Lexi Smith, daughters of Katie Lee Smith. So um, I couldn't resist Bella. I, I, had to have, I, had to have, I had to have a little fun. William F. Lee, AB 72. Wise, thoughtful, open-minded, strategic, selfish, self, selfless. <laughs> it's been a long week. <laughs> strategic, selfless, I'm sorry. I will not live this one down. <laughs> See, this is the only time that word has ever been used in association with Billy, trust me. Wise, thoughtful, open-minded, strategic, selfless, and profoundly dedicated. You've provided steady and ambitious leadership that has advanced the university's core mission of education, research, and service, upheld its commitment to fostering a diverse commu community that values difference and enhanced its governance in ways that will benefit the institution for years to come. Congratulations, Bill.
Presentation of the Harvard Medal to Dwight D. Miller, Master of Education, 1971. For more than half a century, your unwavering pursuit of the brightest minds from all backgrounds and economic circumstances for admission into Harvard College has shaped the student body and greatly enriched the university community. While your signature humor, compassion, and mentorship have nurtured, nurtured a welcoming environment where every person can thrive. Dwight, congratulations. Presentation of the Harvard Medal to Tom Reardon, A.B. 1968. With a clear vision, a collaborative mindset, and a sense of duty to your fellow veterans, you have worked tirelessly to strengthen Harvard's military community, building an extraordinary network that supports thousands of veterans on and off campus, eases their transition into civilian life, and honors their proud history of service and sacrifice. Tom, congratulations. Please join me in congratulating all our 2022 Harvard medalists. Is the world intended for me? Not just me, but the we that fills me. Our shadows reel and dart. Our blood simmers, stirred back. What if the world has never had, will never have our backs? Our inaugural Harvard Alumni Day speaker, a two-term poet laureate for the United States, has used poetry, like what you just heard from her latest poetry collection, to question the world around us and to give us ways to understand and remedy the deep divides we see everywhere. She has published five collections of poetry, including her 2011 book, Life on Mars, which earned her the Pulitzer Prize. In 2021, she was elected a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. She has been hailed as one of the most important poets writing today. Her service to Harvard includes being elected by alumni to serve on the Board of Overseers, one of Harvard's two governing boards. She was also elected by her class of 1994 classmates to the role of Chief Marshal in 2019, and that same year received the prestigious Harvard Arts Medal. Last year, Harvard welcomed her back to campus as Professor of English and of African and African American Studies and the Susan S. and Kenneth L. Wallach Professor at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. It is my great pleasure to introduce our inaugural Harvard Alumni Day speaker, Professor Tracy K. Smith. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I am so overjoyed and grateful to be back in the space together in family. Um, and to share some thoughts that emerge from my gratitude 
for this institution and my hope for what we together can do, what we must do. I just went off script, so the teleprompter is catching up with <laughs> me. Um, one week after commencement, at the end of a season when so much work has been completed and presented and defended, I'd like to begin by sharing the first five lines of an untitled poem that, try as I might, I have not managed to finish. Away, at home, within, where is it we've been this ceaseless season? Winter, summer, whole years blown past by unrelenting wind. I sat in a chair under an old scarred elm, watching the nations of cardinals and jays and the nations of men. I spent days writing and rewriting that poem's next line. Nothing I put down would stick. On my computer, the document actually contains a set of empty brackets marking where the missing piece should go. And they look to me now almost like an open window or door through which the heart of the matter might one day barge or blow in. But I bring those few lines with me today into the air that we eagerly share as a way of admitting why this occasion feels especially emphatic and as a way of sig signaling that it is the poetic imagination, however taxed or beleaguered it may be, that belongs with us here today. Even as we find our way back toward one another, back toward the customs and occasions that we missed for so long and that we crave, I think it's important to admit that our course, by which I mean our understanding not just of where we are going, but of why and how and with whom we must go has changed. To be alive at this moment in the 21st century is to be implicated every day, all the time, in a constant weather of multiple concurrent crises each as urgent as the next. I think to remind ourselves of how urgent they are, we tend to enumerate them on occasions like this one, and the speakers before me have done that powerfully, so I will refrain. But suffice it to say that individually and collectively, physically and psychically, we navigate new terrain. And so what I want to ask you to think about is um, all the many feelings that you carry with you into a celebration like today's. So for me, personally, I'm holding joy for the opportunity to gather, to embrace, to talk and laugh, and simply to be together. Joy that is also part gratitude for what it means to be remembered and recognized and claimed by others. And those feelings, joy and gratitude, are made more pointed and complex by the presence of grief for all we've privately and collectively lost, and courage for what we're called upon to acknowledge, protect, and build anew. And if I'm being honest, um, an abiding fear that makes courage necessary. So that untitled, unfinished poem I just kind of quoted from is, um, it's just a string of fragments. But to be honest with you, I thought it might become the beginning of the remarks that I was invited months ago to offer you right now. I wanted it to help open up a space 
inside of you and me, the space poetry opens up, that was deep and quiet and still. A space from which we could acknowledge the powerful spectrum of feeling and awareness that we move back and forth along many times each day. A space we occupy together, even if it doesn't always feel that way. And where we might choose to linger and admit that we are dizzy, yes, we're tired too, and that we don't know how much more we will be called upon by our current circumstances to learn about ourselves and our neighbors, about the scale of our loss and the necessary dimensions of our hope. I taught myself to meditate in the summer of 2020, not because of joy, not because of gratitude, but as a result of my grief and my fear. I was a novice. What I lacked in discipline, I made up for with desperation. My daily or near daily quiet still space was a black Adirondack chair at the base of an old oak tree in my former backyard near exit nine. <laughs> in New Jersey. <laughs> Stepping out of my house, which was full or always seemingly full with the news or with the aftershock of news, I took heart in what seemed to be the undeterred industry of birds, foxes, and squirrels. Even the trees seemed to move with certainty through the work of each season. And it helped me to see that these other living things still knew what to do. That the terms of their lives remained clear to them, even while the terms governing my human life felt suddenly questionable, alien. And when I sat down, slowed and deepened my breathing and closed my eyes, it wasn't silence or absence that I found. Those are the goals of some forms of meditation that I've read about. But instead, images, figures, and symbols in my mind's eye, and even language in my mind's ear. My journal from the last two years contains entries like this one. I heard the phrase, come to the mountain within as if the work of meditation can be simply attempting to stand still at its peak. Cardinal song seemed to undergird the phrase, come to the mountain within, come to the mountain within. Then other birds, jays possibly with their electric sounding drone, helped me to say to myself or to hear, I want to call something forth. The birds seem to carry that thought up, to let it hover around me, closing in. The cardinals were there when I opened my eyes, flying from tree to tree, calling from the top of my children's jungle gym, but I never saw the other birds. I want to call something forth but I heard the movement of branches and wings. So what was talking to me? Was it me? Maybe. In writing poetry, I've come to accept that there is a part of, my, of me, my unconscious mind, that knows more than I know and fears less than I fear and can say and hear things in language that my everyday self, left to her own devices, might shy away from, not wanting to hear. I believe that a large version of myself, my soul maybe, came to my rescue when called. But I don't believe she was alone. 
I choose to believe she brought ancestors and companions from among the life forms and sources of energy and insight that accompany and surround us. I've spoken often and more and more unabashedly about this form of meditative dialogue as a practice that is aligned with my creative life and more urgently with my ability to stay grounded and keep standing, keep living through the upheavals of our increasingly turbulent time. But I'll admit that doing so today in the company of so many Harvard alumni who live, work, and lead in such specialized vocabularies makes me feel a bit exposed. But I take heart in the fact that, like me, you have been challenged, enlarged, and activated by this institution at formative points in your own lives. And so I choose to speak of you as kin, to speak to you as kin, albeit perhaps the strange cousin or odd aunt who corners you, bearing her own peculiar truth. <laughs> so what have I given you? A stalled poem that points to a mammoth site of collective uncertainty without naming or taming it. A glimmer of a spiritual practice that defies logic, can't be proven, and yet pulls the practitioner toward sources of knowledge and clarity that counteract fear and futility. I guess I'm inviting you to consider that there are tools and terms beyond those typically indexed to the work we do within institutions like Harvard, which are also nevertheless essential to the project of collective human flourishing. I'm thinking beyond the pillars, uh, the essential fields and disciplines which help us measure hold accountable, and sustain our social institutions. I'm thinking about what else bolsters our health, dignity, access, and, and what sets the terms of our civic care and regard. I say civic care. Um, when I traveled um, in the position of Poet Laureate a handful of years ago now, I would often be asked this question in the Q&A session that wasn't about poetry. It was, what do you do for self-care? It's a phrase we're familiar with, um, but at the time it was new to me. Um, how do you take care of yourself? I came to understand because I was being asked this question by people of color, people who identified as queer, people who are marginalized in various ways in our culture, that self-care is a political act, especially for a person that looks like me. Um, I, I want to imagine that there's something collective, and I'm calling it civic care, that we might also engage in for the same reasons and with the same others in mind as essential to our own living and thriving. So what does it mean to flourish in a time of uncertainty? Might flourishing be the result of living together in such a way that love, rather than mere tolerance, community, rather than division or tribalism, and reciprocity rather than transactional exchange com comprise the things we seek to offer and receive. I ask because not only are we no longer where many of us thought we were, and thought so as recently as the last time we gathered here as a body just, just a few years ago, we may never truly have been where we as a nation, or as a civilization long believed ourselves to be. And so let us try to get and to be elsewhere. I had the audacity to read you an unfinished poem of my own, um, but I want to make it up to you <laughs> by reading an indelible, fully realized poem by the great American poet Lucille Clifton. Clifton, I hope you all know her work, but if you don't, um, was a fierce champion 
of black life, black joy, black truth, and the central role that those things play to this nation's existence. Um, she's a poet who makes concrete and concise what it looks like to love, claim, and also to nurture awe for those that our culture has not yet taught us to fully revere. This is her poem, Study the Masters. Like my Aunt Timmy, it was her iron, or one like hers, that smoothed the sheets the master poet slept on. Home or hotel, what matters is he lay himself down on her handiwork and dreamed. She dreamed too. Words, some Cherokee, some Maasai, and some huge and particular as hope. If you had heard her chanting as she ironed, you would understand form and line and discipline and order and America. So the speaker's Aunt Timmy is the poem's under-acknowledged master. She's not singular. The poem tells us there are others like her, pushing irons like hers across sheets or shirts that belong to others. If we don't know their names, it is because we haven't been taught them and haven't thought to ask. And while no reader of this poem is surprised that the master poet dreamed, the work of the poem is to remind us that Aunt Timmy dreamed too. In fact, Aunt Timmy, not the poet, is the master of the poem's title. And her dreams are the site where the huge and particular terms of our humanity crystallize and converge. And the poem is also a site where the huge and particular scales of language converge. So concepts like dream and hope, for example, are anchored by small images like iron and handiwork. In the poem's closing lines, that beautiful list, form and line and discipline and order and America, they invite me to consider nationhood by way of the lines corralling us within strata and communities, the lanes hurtling us toward or else swerving us away from forms of community and belonging, and the discipline that keeps us safe within our roles or punishes us for demanding new terms. I feel so fortunate to have been in rooms where Lucille Clifton read her poems, um, and I've heard audience members swoon at the music of her language and chuckle at the ironies to which her poems succinctly bear witness. But I think a poem like this asks to be taken to heart in a way that makes it harder simply to chuckle, to swoon, to go home from the reading and lie down expecting to dream like the master poet without puzzling over what the aunt's chanting in the poem was aimed at and what it sought to conjure. Without marveling at the true mastery, the poem sets out to celebrate. When I think about all that you and I as alumni have been given, all we've earned, demonstrated, innovated, and refined, all the feats that distinguish us and shine deserved light back on this marvelous place, there is an increasingly audible voice in my mind that begins to ask, what if the status conferred upon us by these achievements is aligned with a notion of human valuing that a poem like Study the Masters asks us to mistrust? Not that we should undermine or deny what is achieved here, 
and not that we should revert to the false modesty that once upon a time may have led some of us to say things like, I went to college in Massachusetts. <laughs> but perhaps it's useful to remind ourselves that the wish to protect what one has earned and a reverence for the status it confers can fortify the lines and the lanes holding us apart from one another. It's hard not to feel the wish to retreat to the security of standing and achievement in times like this one, where loss and violence and devastation are frighteningly commonplace. Um, but I want to offer you another poem that is strange and mysterious and vulnerable and that strikes me as uncannily well suited to our time of upheaval. D.H. Lawrence's Song of a Man Who Has Come Through is a poem in which the speaker wants to accept change, to meet the moment, and to become a vessel of belief and possibility. It's a poem that was written in 1914, so it's the first world war that's in the world. And it's also a poem that was written soon after his marriage. And so love and the ecstasy of that kind of union is also um, something the poet is eager to claim. Um, but there's chaos. There's loss and violence and confusion. And so that easy embracing of the pure, the revelatory, the ecstatic, it's, it's not easy. Song of a man who has come through. Not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me. A fine wind is blowing the new direction of time. If only I can let it bear me, carry me, if only it carry me. If only I am sensitive, subtle, Oh, delicate, a winged gift. If only, most lovely of all, I yield myself and am borrowed by the fine, fine wind that takes its course through the chaos of the world like a fine and exquisite chisel, a wedge blade inserted. If only I am keen and hard like the sheer tip of a wedge driven by invisible blows, the rock will split. We shall come at the wonder. We shall find the Hesperides. Oh, for the wonder that bubbles into my soul. I would be a good fountain, a good wellhead, would blur no whisper, spoil no expression. What is the knocking. What is the knocking at the door in the night? It is somebody wants to do us harm. No. No. It is the three strange angels. Admit them. Admit them. I feel in the breathless, insistent cadence of repetition in the poem's opening lines that the speaker's effort is earnest but difficult. He repeats, not I, not I, and if only, if only, the closest he gets to enacting this wished-for version of himself is to announce his intentions, to say what will and what shall occur. In fact, his syntax is most assured when he feels perhaps least certain, when he says, the rock will split, we shall come at the wonder, we shall find the Hesperides. The poem lingers a moment in this willed certainty, 
But then very quickly, it reverts to conditional language. Oh, for the wonder that bubbles into my soul, I would be a good fountain, would blur no whisper, spoil no expression. This sense of wish, of intention, which is, even I, I hate this word, it's aspirational. It takes up two thirds of the poem. And even there, it can't disguise the fact that it is merely a wish, a fantasy. My favorite part of the poem is the moment of intrusion, the instant when something breaks in to arrest the speaker's reverie. The first time I heard this poem read aloud, it was read by the amazing poet Marie Howe. And um, she did this when she got to that moment of the poem. What is the knocking? What is the knocking at the door in the night? And it brought my human fears into the room with me. It reminded me that we live in a world where there are things outside of the door that I know are real and that I know may well have me in their sights. Um, and, and somehow that was terrifying and emphatic and a necessary reminder that the imagination in this poem is choosing another direction, right? First, the speaker's actual or dominant or fearful mind rushes to answer the question and says, it is somebody wants to do us harm. And I move back and forth most days along a path similar to the poem speaker, wanting to throw off my limitations and my fears and my known self and instead to become keen and hard like the sheer tip of a wedge driven by invisible blows with purpose and fearlessness. Um, because this age we live in requires as much of those of us who seek to be of use. But what if that's not who we are? What if the fear that rises quite naturally in response to the danger, disillusionment, and uncertainty of our time holds us back from such an easy embrace of courage or heroism. In this poem, there is no other voice that breaks in to alter the course of events. Instead, what stops Lawrence's speaker from getting carried away by his own fight or flight instinct is a willed leap of his own imagination. He talks himself back. No, no he assures himself, though how can he be sure that the knocking at the door in the night is not somebody come to do us harm? How can he be certain it is, instead, a kind of annunciation? How can he say with such assurance to himself, to us, it is the three strange angels? Nothing in this poem is natural or easy. Nothing is without urging or insistence. Even the poem's last line, admit them, admit them, insists upon meaning two things at once, maybe more. One, let them in, let them in. And another, concede that there are angels among us. I don't think it's courage or wherewithal that allows the speaker to break out of the circuitry of his own fear. I think it is need. He cannot change himself. He cannot deny the change blowing in on a fine wind. But he can open the door, expecting not burglars or assassins, but angels. Because look how desperately he needs them. Maybe the poem that I started writing, the one that stalled, might take recourse to a similar cocktail of dogged insistence, hope, and desperation. Just as those of us who want peace, safety, justice, and so much else, who want to flourish together with others, whatever that means, and however it might be brought about, must admit the masters and angels, the ancestors and other sources of light and insight among us. 
because look how desperately we need them. Thank you so much. Professor Smith, thank you for letting us soon to your words and observations of the world around us. No Harvard gathering would be complete without the singing of our school anthem. So before we close these afternoon exercises, please stand and join me as we sing Fair Harvard. The words will appear on the screens. On behalf of the Harvard Alumni Association, let me once again thank you, our alumni, for all that you've done over these past several years to keep your networks and communities connected during these unprecedented times. The strength and compassion you've shown and shared is what makes this alumni body so special. So today, I applaud all of you. Honored guests, fellow alumni, friends and family, thank you for joining us in person and on the live stream. And thank you for your support of our special community of alumni and of Harvard. We will reconvene next year on June 2nd, 2023. I now hereby declare the 2022 meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association adjourned. Once again, and so we come to the conclusion of the inaugural Harvard Alumni Day and the 152nd meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association. Harvard President Larry Bacow addressed the assembled alumni and responded to a question he was asked recently, which was, what accounts for Harvard's extraordinary reputation? President Bacow said there were really three things. First were the faculty, and he described a number of uh, famous faculty members. He mentioned so many prizes won by the faculty, and he said that Harvard University benefits from some of the greatest minds on the planet. Second were the students accomplished in all sorts of fields. But most importantly, he talked about the alumni. And as we say, Bill, in the Alumni Association, you're a student for a couple of years and you spend your rest of your life as an alum. But he mentioned how Im the important contributions Harvard alumni have made 
to public service, to music, to sports, to technology, to business. And he said that he also challenges alumni to work on a variety of issues, including the issues that threaten our democracy, climate change that threatens our world, and gun violence, which is a public health issue that needs a lot of attention. He urged the alumni to believe in the idea of Harvard and to pass on to our children and grandchildren a world that is a better place. So that was President Backow's address today at on the first Harvard Alumni Day. Bill, maybe you can tell us about Speaker Tracy Smith. I'd love to, Nancy. I, I felt Tracy K. Smith brought us along on a personal journey, a personal emotional journey in her process of thinking about the world today. She talked first about an unfinished poem and how that led her to meditative dialogue and that her soul came to her rescue in that process. Her, her message then came to alumni of, where she said, like me, you've been activated by Harvard. So I want to speak to you as kin. And it wasn't just her words, it was her voice and her emotive, uh, physical language. And she said, what have I given you today? She said, I've given you collective uncertainty in the sense of having been addressing an unfinished, unfinished poem, but then given us a glimmer of a practice that's helped her, this meditative dialogue to counteract fear and futility. So she said, we need tools beyond the institutional tools that we've come accustomed to using to counteract this fear and this futility. It goes beyond those pillars that we need to engage in what she called civic care. Go beyond personal care to civic care. And then she finished, and this doesn't do any justice to her, her full point, but she finished with a poem by D.H. Lawrence where there's a knocking at a door. Three hard knocks, she told us. Where there were three, three strange angels. And Lawrence asked us to admit them, to admit them. And in her interpretation of that, it is, you could be at first at fear of what knocks in the middle of the night. But if we're ready to admit what might be right about the world and expand ourselves into that, then we're ready to embrace the ideas of civic care and go into the future uh, with a presence. I, I was struck by her emotional journey that she felt and took us along with. So in terms of that, let them in, she said, let those free strange angels in and concede that there may be angels among us. So with that, Nancy, I, I think we can wind down the webcast for today. It's been an enjoyable time. The sun came out just in time for the beginning of our first annual Global Alumni Day. And I think it's a good time for you to recite the words of our poet and former Harvard faculty member, Seamus Haney. So over to you, Nancy. Yes, Professor Haney uh, wrote this poem, John Harvard Walks the Yard. A spirit moved, John Harvard walked the yard. The atom lay unsplit, the west unwon, the books stood open and the gates unbarred. The maps dreamt on like moon dust, nothing stirred. The future was a verb in hibernation. A spirit moved, John Harvard walked the yard. Before the classic style, before the clabbered, all through the small hours of an origin, the book stood open and the gate unbarred. Night passage of a migratory bird. Wing flap, gown flap, like a homing pigeon, a spirit moved, John Harvard walked the yard. Was that his soul? Look, 
sped to its reward by grace or works. A shooting star, an omen, the book stood open and the gate unbarred. Begin again where frosts and tests were hard, find yourself a founder. Here, imagine, a spirit moves, John Harvard walks the yard. The books stand open and the gates unbarred. Well, Nancy, thank you. And with those insightful thoughts from Seamus Haney, we bid you, our audience, farewell. And thank you for being with us as our guest today. We've heard from two inspiring speakers, Harvard President Larry Bacow and Tracy, Sk Tracy K. Smith, who have made this stage again a place where history can be made with their words. Only time will tell. For us, though, it's been a pleasure to host you. And as you enjoyed the charm and enchantment of these ancient rites and the inaugural Global Harvard Alumni Day. Thank you for joining us. And until next year, June 2nd, 2003, 23, we bid you a fond farewell.